Okay. And let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, you remember then uh, when we wrote the wave equation at the beginning, at the very beginning of the course, we said, uh, um, look, in vacuum, the wave equation is very simple because you just have uh, the standard D'Alembert equation. Okay? But where you are not, when you are not in vacuum, okay, I remind you that in the wave equation, there is a non-homogeneous term that is the second derivative of the depolarization that is induced in the medium. And if you do not have a model of the polarization of your medium, so if you don't know how it polarizes once you apply an electric field to how the charges separate, then you are dead. You cannot solve the problem. Now, in general physics uh, courses, what you say very simply, you say, okay, the polarization is proportional to the electric field. So the second derivative of the P becomes the second derivative of the field with respect to time twice. You have this term here, you bring on this side, and then you define the dielectric, the relative dielectric constant, epsilon half. So everything goes as if, instead of having a medium that is characterized by epsilon naught, you have a medium that is characterized by epsilon naught times epsilon half. And the speed is slow, is smaller, and everything goes the same way then you are safe. But we said that be careful. In reality, very often, the polarization, it is not along the same direction of the electric field. You apply the field like this, and the polarization is like that. It may happen in media. If they are anisotropic. And so in general, the dependency between the polarization and the Electric field goes to a tensor, and the tensor is the susceptibility, the electric susceptibility tensor. That is a rank two tensor. In our simple approach, is a matrix three by three. The second thing we said: that be careful that this tensor has components that might depend on the frequency of light. So if you have a, a monochromatic wave, an harmonic wave at a certain frequency, chi can have a certain set of values, the components. If you change the frequency, chi can have different components. And that means that in general, the refractive index that is a medium is showing to an electromagnetic wave might depend on the frequency. And this is named dispersion of the refractive index. Then we also said, be careful that this tensor might even be not real, but might be complex. So it might be a complex number. That means that the refractive index in general, in, in physics, in general physics courses, we say that the refractive index is n, is a real number. Maybe they, it may have an imaginary part. And this imaginary part is named the extinction coefficient with a Greek kappa letter. And this comes out from the fact that the system can absorb light. Now, today, we give a, sh a short description of this number one, and we start describing uh, 
where these two effects come from, the number two and number three, okay? Now, concerning number one, and we go to a very difficult formalism, but we try to make it simple for you. Please keep in mind that one of the major topics in physics is an engineering is always response theory to predict how a system responds to a solicitation okay our colleagues that are in civil engineering here they want to know how a concrete uh, bar will bend if you put a person on this side you want to build the balcony you want to know how much you can charge this a mechanical engineer wants to know how much it can solicit the material before it breaks up. Okay, and here is the same. We want to know how much is the polarization when you apply an electric field, and this is a general uh, approach in physics and engineering. So what we say today could be true for other fields, and we we want to be a bit more specific. And we do the following. First of all, we say, okay, look, the polarization that you have in a medium, do you see me if I point with my marker on the blackboard? Yes, on the whiteboard, or maybe I can point here. The polarization that you have in the medium at a certain position in the space and at a certain time may depend on the electric field that you have at that time in another place so maybe you apply the field here and you want to know the response in another position and it may depend on the value of the electric field at times before the time t where you are when you are measuring okay the most simple effect that you can have in mind and the most striking is in magnetism when you study hysteresis the value of the magnetization depends on the value of the magnetic field times before. So, in principle, if you want to know the polarization at a certain position in a certain time, you have to take the, the field in another position, another time, and you have to apply the so-called response function. So, the response function will operate on this field and will tell you uh, what is the polarization, but you have to integrate it all over time with time starting from minus infinite to the time where you want to know the polarization. And you have to integrate all over the volume because the field here might depend on the fields everywhere else. Okay, so you have an integration in time and in space. And what's more, this this quantity here that is the response function might be a tensorial function a rank two tensor that is combining the components of the electric field okay this is general now very often in all fields uh, of uh, technology you make an approximation and you say oh look the response is local what does it mean what does it mean what is happening here depends on, on what it is here, okay? You see that already here in this room, it is not true because what I am doing depends on you that are in the room and on they who are far from here, okay? But we approximate and say, okay, let's think, you know, let's assume that the, the response is local. So there is an absence of sp spatial dependency or as it's called, there is no spatial dispersion. And we simply say, okay, the polarization at a certain time T depends on the electric fields at the precedent times, okay? Times uh, a response function integrated all over time. And uh, you can write it in a simplified form like this. Of course, since the response function is zero after time t because the response function defines what happened before not what after instead of integrating from minus infinite to t 
you can integrate to a minus infinite to plus infinite and assume that r is different from zero only before the time t okay now in terms of cartesian components what does it mean that the, the, com the x component of the polarization at a certain time t depends on the x x component of this rank two tenths of time the electric field component x at times before and so on so on and so on i simply calculated the, the product between the three by three matrix that represents the tensor and the vector e so in general the polarization as an x component that might depend on the field along the y and z component also Okay. In that sense, in uh, general physics courses, when you write this expression here, this expression here that is written, you are assuming that the chi tensor is diagonal. Okay, it's uh, and therefore you don't mix the, the the components. But in general, it is not. Okay. Now, and here it comes uh, the, mm, let's say the approach can be, uh, we can refine the approach. We know that if we have a, um, a time dependent function, even if it is not periodic, you can write it in terms of its Fourier transform, okay? So you can define the Fourier transform of the field E, so E omega written here, and you, you define it as the one over two pi, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the field times this complex exponential E to the E omega T times the T. So you integrate all over time this expression and you work out the Fourier uh, transform. This Fourier transforms gives to you the amplitude of the components at frequency omega that are constituting your signal. And once you define the Fourier transform, you can uh, write the anti transform formula, which permits you to go from the Fourier transform to the field. So the field can be written as its Fourier transform times a to the minus uh, e omega t times the omega. So forgive me if I will do this, but sometimes I call the imaginary unit I and sometimes it is named J. So you are acquainted to this, please forgive me if I do it. Now, what does it happen if you take the expression of the polarization, okay? And you express the electric field in terms of its Fourier transform. You simply substitute here to the electric field its Fourier transform, okay? That is e, uh, the anti transform, so this expression here. It's this Fourier transform e to the minus i omega t minus standard prime integrated over all over omega, okay? Now, what you do, you swap the integrals here. You see here you have the integral in omega that is inside the integral in dt prime, you swap the two integrals and you before integrate all over dt prime and then you integrate all over omega. And you do this and you say the polarization at time t is uh, the integral all over omega from minus infinity to plus infinity times the integral all over time of this expression here times the Fourier transform of the field times the exponential e to the minus j omega t times g omega, okay? And now you say, okay, but look at this term here that is in brackets, in the square brackets here, this term here. This term here that is written here is the Fourier transform of the R uh, tensor, okay, of the response tensor. And you call this Fourier transform the susceptibility, chi one tensor, okay? Now, 
Of course, this is a Fourier transform, so it should depend from omega. And here we have a, a formalism that is used in optics that you write like this. For the moment, we shall not use this. You could also erase this term here. But normally in optics, you write here a frequency that is minus the sum of frequencies or difference of frequency that is on the right hand side. But here you have just one frequency, omega, and so this should be minus omega, but it is just a formalism. It will be clearer later on when we shall uh, discuss about this. So you can define this quantity as the Fourier transform of the response, and then the polarization is equal to epsilon naught times the product of the Fourier transforms of, of the electric field and of the response function that we name susceptivity. And all this is a Fourier term that is anti-transformed and that gives P, okay? And now you do the following. You say, look, I wrote P like this. Okay, with simple passages, not simple, really complex passages. But in general, I can write the polarization that is a time dependent function by means of its Fourier uh, transforms. I can write it this. Then I compare these two expressions here, compare them, and I realize that this term here, P omega, must be equal to the tensorial product of this component here. So I can write down and say P, the polarization is equal to epsilon naught chi one times the electric field, okay? Now, here we must be really very much careful to understand this uh, definition okay and uh, that must be clear that means that if you have a wave okay that is harmonic at a single frequency omega one okay single frequency then the electric field will have just one Fourier component okay you don't have a function, no? you have just a single component, then your medium will polarize, okay? And the polarization will have just one comp component at frequency omega one, okay? And the polarization will be the amplitude of the field at frequency omega one times the value of the susceptibility at that frequency, omega one times a constant, okay? But if you change the frequency of your field, you will induce polarization at a different frequency. You change to omega two, the, the polarization will be at omega two and its amplitude at that frequency will be given by the amplitude of the field at omega two times a constant times how much it is the susceptivity at that frequency. And in general, the susceptivity will be different depending on the frequency, okay? Now, if I have a field that it is not harmonic, but has got any time dependent dependency, I can develop it in its Fourier components. Each Fourier components will give rise to a Fourier component of the polarization. And each Fourier component of the polarization will be connected to the field by the value of the susceptivity at that frequency. And the real polarization in the medium will be the sum of the contribution of all these components will be the Fourier anti-transform of the Fourier spectrum of the polarization. This is really difficult to grab at the beginning, but you, what you need to understand that when people 
giving you courses in optics is putting there this expression here, okay? Very simply, they are really uh, uh, somehow making it very, 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 very simple, okay? This expression here in reality is valid for the frequency component. The frequency component of the polarization of frequency omega is the field at the frequency times the value of the susceptivity at that frequency. Okay? So why do we introduce this type of formalism? Because we shall see in the following lectures, we will give a very short description of nonlinear optics. And when you go to nonlinear optics, this is really very important. And you will see how it plays a role. Now, sorry, before we go ahead with this, th that explains, sorry, that explains somehow why I should expect this type of description here explains why I should expect that the polarization is not directed like the electric field. Okay, and now we see a very simple consequence of this that I want to share with you. We go back to the blackboard here. Think that you have a this is the propagation direction, x. This is y and z. And let's think that we have a, a field, a, a wave, an electromagnetic wave, to which we associate a field that is polarized at 45 degrees with respect to the y direction, okay? So when we discussed about polarization, that means that the field has got two components, that these two components have got the same amplitude, and we have something like this. Let me... Let's assume a forward propagation wave. And the two components have the same amplitude and the same phase, okay? Would you remember when we said the amplitude is the same and the phase is the same, if you wish, we could write it like this. We could write plus phi plus phi. So there is a phase, but they are the same. And before I had written the simplest case, phi equal to zero. Then you have linear polarization at 45 degrees, okay? Now let's think that at a certain moment, your wave goes through a material, a slab of material. And let's think that this slab has got a thickness that is D, okay? And let's think that this slab has a refractive index that is depending on the polarization of light, okay? That means if light is polarized along this direction, okay, the material shows a refractive index, we call it NY. If light is polarized along this direction, the Z direction, the material shows a refractive index that is NZ. This is typical, the so-called birefringent media. Okay, now, what does it happen to light when it does go 
to this system here. What will happen? And uh, I ask you, okay, if I assume that at a time, and I don't know how to, at time t equal to zero, I am on the front surface. Of the material so my wave that is coming from here and we assume it's a plane wave gets inside the material at time zero if you want if in a section u this is x i have a plane wave coming from here and at time t equal to zero i am here okay then i wish to know this the fronts get here What is the phase of the wave when I get to the exit of this material? Now, the field can be decomposed in its two components. So there is one component along Y, one component along Z, okay? The component that is along Y experiences the refractive index and y and so travels at a certain speed inside the material the component that is polarized along z travels in the medium and then experiences a different refractive index so they travel with a different speed and so their relative phase changes okay so at the entrance here you add uh, a linearly polarized field at 45 degrees so the two components are in phase but when you go to the exit how much is it the phase difference it's very simple because let's say the field the phase of the y component how much is it when you get the exit x is equal to d the k vector, we can call it uh, two pi over lambda naught times the refractive index of the material along the y direction times d, this is this term here, minus omega t plus pi. This is the phase of the y component. What is the phase of the Z component of pi over lambda naught and Z D minus omega T plus pi. So they are dephased. Okay. Now, what is the phase difference at the exit between these two? You make the difference, then it comes out two pi over lambda naught. The difference of the refractive indices along the two directions times the thickness of your material. So if the refractive index along the two directions is the same, ny minus nz is zero, the phase difference is zero. And so at the exit of the medium, you have linear polarization at 45 degrees, exactly the same. But say, for example, that this delta phi, let me, so this delta phi, that is T y minus T z, so 2 pi over lambda naught, and y minus n z times the thickness. Say that delta phi is equal to pi over 2. What will it be the polarization if the phase difference is plus or minus pi, uh, uh, pi over two? If here you have a 
if here would have a phase difference that is not zero but pi over two what did we say in the polarization lecture we said that the polarization is circular okay so you would have that you have a circular circularly polarized light depending of plus or minus you will have left or right hand of light okay so a material that is anisotropic ch can change the polarization of your light and let you pass from a linear polarization to circular polarization okay and what does it mean that if you want that this value is pi over two this must be two pi over lambda naught system that means that there must be a relation between the refractive index difference between your materials and the thickness of your sample because you see pi and pi go away that means that and uh, y minus n z times d must be equal to plus or minus pi over four so if you know the refractive indices of your material you can choose the thicknesses of this slab of the material to get circular polarization okay now where is this used everywhere in your life where is it used in your laptop computer in a laptop comput computer you have a backlight in the back of your computer there is a, a set of lamps okay so you have led emitters led emitters that emit unpolarized light okay then you have a, a piece of plastic that is a polaroid that is made in a such way that the light that is emitted by these leds that is unpolarized when it goes through this polaroid comes out and it is linearly polarized so the polaroid transmitted only transmits only polarized light okay then you have uh, this is in the back of your skin in front of your skin you have another polarizer and this polarizer polarizer lets go through only light that is polarized vertically okay and therefore here light that is coming here that is horizontally polarized will not go through and you would see the screen that is black okay this is when your screen is black it's clear to you then what do you put here inside in the middle in between you put a liquid crystal cell how is it constituted a liquid crystal cell it is a cell i mark like this where you have molecules and these molecules are really very much oriented 
And by applying an electric field between the two extrema, you can rotate the molecules like this, okay? Now, which molecules are there inside? You studied it. chemistry. They are that kind of molecules that are something like this, for example, okay? Conjugated molecules where charge can flux all over here. It can be delocalized. So these molecules, they are highly polarizable. And what does it happen if you have a molecule like this and you apply an electric field like this? Charge likes to move along this direction, doesn't like to move along this direction, such type of molecule. So if you apply the electric field like, like this, this will not polarize. But if you apply like the electric field like this, then charge will move a lot and you will induce dipole moment. You will move charges here and there, okay? So in general, if you have a molecule like this and you apply an electric field along this direction, charge will move along the axis of the molecule and the polarization will be induced along this direction. So it is a strongly anisotropic system. So what you do, you put in here a liquid crystal lens and you align in the way that it shows uh, a certain refractive index along these two directions. And if you apply an electric field such that the phase difference between the two components of light is pi over two, you will change polarization from linear to circular. And more, if you apply, if you make that the phase difference is pi, what you do is rotate the polarization by 90 degrees. So electrically, you can make that so the polarization that at the entrance is horizontal here, it gets vertical and light will go through and you will see a light stream. So here you have two polarizers and the system that is turning the polarization that is an active by refringent material, okay? This is your way, the way you use it. Therefore, keep in mind, these screens here emit polarized light because the last filter is a polarizer, okay? Now, why do I give you this expression here? Because in the exercises, not, not this, let's say this expression here in the test, it may happen that I ask you, if you have a birefringent material with two different refractive indices and you have a linearly polarized light arriving on the system, what will it be the polarization if the thickness is three millimeters and the refractive indices are this and that? Okay, you simply calculate this and you see how much is the phase difference. If it is pi over two, it is circular. If it is zero, is linear, and so on. So all the results that we did. This to describe anisotropy, the reason why there is anisotropy. Now, we go back to the slides. So somehow we explained, you see the mouse on the remote screen, but I don't see anymore on my screen. Oh, yeah. We explained why the material should be anisotropic. And now we want to ask ourselves, where are these effects coming from? We stop for 10 minutes and then we start again. So what time is it? It's
in fast dimensional. Let me always tell you it is. Twenty to no a quarter to six. We start at five to six. Okay. 